This program is intended for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advised. Okay, now we're live. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, this week's Pop Culture Podcast has Tom and Molly together. Well, not together, but they're here with us. We're in separate rooms. Same house. Separate rooms. Yeah. Anything we need to know? Anything going on? What? Fights? Why we're not in the same fights? room? Fights or something? Yeah. Why aren't you I don't like sharing room? a screen with him. Okay. Now it's out. Now it's out. All right. Oh, well. Our guest this week is Dan from... Am I pronouncing your name right? Yes, sir. I had to actually Google it before this and asked Molly. Just to check. I, I hate, I hate mispronouncing names, but Dan from the Guffs uh, is here, and you know a lot of a lot of our audience is in Milwaukee, and of course, if you live in Milwaukee, if you're alive in the 1990s, my God, you you know who this band is. Um, you guys got incredible airplay in Milwaukee, mid to late 90s. It was un, it was unreal. Um, thanks for coming on. Um, I, you know, I guess I want to dive back to the beginning. You guys started in the late 80s but you really hit your stride in the 90s coming up in Milwaukee. What was that Milwaukee music scene like back in the 90s? Uh, you know, early on, it was really interesting because there's only a handful of places like on the east side and a couple Marquette bars that we really were focused on and hitting. And, you know, if back in the day, the unicorn was the place to be. So that's where we sort of cut our teeth yeah. and started doing like, a, you know, just sort of a, a monthly gig there. And Gus was just anybody who knew the unicorn or Gus, man, is just it was just such an epic place, that whole Sydney High vibe, and the, the whole scene sort of coalesced around that. Um, but everybody that's been in the Unicorn, you know, legally you could only have about 50 people, but we'd have 100, 120 people in there, and it was just a fire hazard. So eventually wow. we made our way over to the boardwalk. Around that time, the Celebrity Club opened up, which then became the Vox. It was that little space just uh, south of uh, Collectivo on Prospect. Mm -hmm. um, and... Then slowly, you know, for every local band, you know, you made your way up the, you know, up the rungs. So you went from there to Virginia's. And then once we hit Shank Hall, which was the biggest like club in town, then that for us, that was like, all right, we made it. You know, and that took us from about 1988 to about 1993 by the time we started playing Shank Hall regularly. But the scene was cool, man. It was just uh, it was like fragmented. It was it was a little a little bit of everything across mm -hmm. the board. There was ska, there was punk, there was something heavier. We were obviously a little bit more poppy and twangy. There was more alt country. There was just so much going on in the city. And the city was just, at the time we started, I was 17 years old, man. So I was, I was, I couldn't believe what was going on. And every time we'd go out to the BBC, we'd go out to some other club, we'd see some other bands. I was just blown away by what was happening. It was just a really cool vibe, really cool scene. Um, you know, and we just, you know, we're fortunate enough to be, the, be there be in the right place at the right time. So yeah. So you yeah, started sure. at the unicorn. I got a question about that. Does yeah. that still mean what a unicorn means today? Oh hell no, no. I, I got <laughs> I, I got no idea why why Gus <laughs> named, named it that in the first place. But because isn't a unicorn like a married couple looks for a girl to join them? <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's if that's if that's if you ask the husband Tom, but maybe for. <laughs> The Mollies of the world, maybe the unicorn is a bull. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, so I think that all all depends on perspective, uh, objectivity, or lack thereof. You know, so yeah. definitely this is uh, just my subliminal way of throwing hints at Mollies and she's <laughs> I, I dude, I, I I literally had to figure out what a unicorn was like within the last two or three years. I'm like, really? Okay, cool. Yeah. But then depending on, you know, what, what clique or group you're in, there's so many different kinds of unicorns, you know? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, my mom says hi, Dana. Oh, hey, if I remember correctly, I, th I think she kind of dug me. Yeah, you're her Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> my mom sets realistic goals. She knows she can't get Jason Momoa, but she sure as hell can smash the bases from the guns. There you go, man. Well, hey. You know, all 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 is fair in uh, in elderly lady fantasies. So it's all good. I don't, 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can look at your mom the same now. <laughs> I don't know if I can look at myself the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is gonna be one of them shows, right? I it, I it is. It is. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, well, let's talk about some of your solo stuff. You've got uh, you've got a solo project that you're working on. You know, let's tell us about that. Yeah. So just something you know. I've you know I I grew up playing. Uh, so Gorn, the lead singer of the band, was a classically trained pianist, and I grew up uh, playing guitar. So I was always like the 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 black sheep. I had to do whatever whatever somebody in the family wasn't doing. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was always picking on guitar, but by the time I got to probably like eighth grade, ninth grade, when all of a sudden bands were starting to form and you wanted to be in a band, we had so many guitar players that were way better than I ever could be. And so then I made the conscious decision. I'm like, I'm going to go to four strings, you know, four strings is a little bit easier. And then over the, the period of however many years, you know, like 40 years later, I've sort of found my groove. Um, but then, but I've always played guitar and we always would write when, God, you know, Goran and I were primary songwriters in the band. So him and I would write together. And a lot of times we would just come on like, hey, I got this really cool chord progression or I've got this really cool melody. And then we'd sort of bounce it off of each other and we'd build things that way. And then anybody who knows the band, we've gone through a couple periods of just sort of, you know, stagnant dormancy where we just life gets in the way of, of music. And all of a sudden you want a house, you want kids, you want a wife and then. Later on, you find yourself, you don't want a house, you don't want kids, you don't want a wife. And then you just sort of pick up a guitar and the guitar was always there. And I've always been uh, into folk music. I've always been, you know, I grew up on listening like early REM. So anybody listening to like Chronic Town, Let's Active, anything from like Athens, Georgia, the early 80s sort of understands. I was like sort of that, that precursor to alt country or, you know, like the Uncle Tupelo's and, uh, you know, uh, the predecessors of Wilco, you know, and, and Sunbull, that kind of thing. So I was always really drawn to that music. And then back in the early 90s, when the band just started, I got a job working in this um, really cool little Bohemian Cafe. And we just had like a whole wall like this just filled with records. And all these records were just, it was all kinds of different stuff. So I started listening to like Ry Cooter, Doc Watson, um, you know, listening to Towns Van Zant, early Steve Earle, Lucinda Williams and stuff. And that Stuff always just stuck in the back of my head. Mm -hmm. And that I realized all of a sudden that sort of like stylistically in terms of my my ability, that's what I could play. Like sort of that little sort of grass, uh, you know, bluegrassy kind of sounding country kind of like, you know, um chukka kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And that's how it sort of evolved. I just literally started playing some songs and I realized I started writing a same kind of style and song. And then I sort of took that and developed this idea. It's like, you know, so my name is Dan Crawl, but like Daniel Ray is like the bastardization of my name. So everybody called me Dan, Daniel, Danny my whole life. And my last name, Crawl, in Slavic means king. So Ray is uh, king in Spanish. And I figured yeah. it sounds a lot better to say I'm Daniel Ray and I'm playing this sort of clucky, you know, alt country Americana stuff rather than trying to like pronounce my name and going, who's this Eastern European freak that's trying to come off as like an alt country guy? <laughs> So just a little bit of a, you know, nom, nom de guerre, you know, um, for misappropriation of terms, but uh, just started doing this about 2018 and just been kicking at it. Just a little side project just keeps me busy, gets me in the dive bars, you know, keep, keeps me playing music and drinking beer and whiskey, which is kind of my thing. Yeah, there you go. I like it. Yeah, Daniel awesome. Ray. Um, I yeah, I, I uh, checked it out on uh, Apple Music. I didn't know that you had a side project until we booked the show. So I was a little late yeah, on that. Well, I was a little I, late on the on that that news. Uh, that's that's right. I, I, I really, I'm really not good at promote, promoting myself, and so I'm just keeping it very very organic. I'm going to just seep into the masses like over the next 20 years. By the time I call it a day, everybody will know who I was. <laughs> <laughs> Are you doing shows now? Uh, I've been doing, a, yeah, I've been doing a handful of shows, uh, played a couple of shows down here in Chicago, uh, out in Berwyn where, uh, my, my kid lives. And, um, so probably going to try to get back up into Milwaukee, Wisconsin in earnest, probably 2022, you know, it's, things are still a little bit weird with COVID. And mm -hmm. so down, I don't know how are things up North lately. I haven't been up there since Summerfest, but even with Summerfest, when we played Summerfest, um, there was a big sort of, you know, to do about all the new COVID restrictions Max. and stuff like that. And, you know, yeah. I did a little piece on, uh, for, uh, I think it was, um, NBC four, uh, where they interviewed me and a couple other people. And it's like, you know, you, you want to, you want people to come into a venue and you want them to be safe, man. You don't want anybody like leaving your mm -hmm. show and 
all of a sudden you're hearing somebody like dies because they came to your show. That kind of really would suck. Right. You know? And then what that means about the music, I'm really not sure, but I think that's pretty strong, you know, implication that something happened badly. Um, so, you know, we're trying to do things smart and here in Chicago, it's a little bit more dynamic, a little bit bigger, uh, population. So we're going through a series of mask ups and shutdowns and, you know, all these yeah. different little things until we try to figure out what's happening. So, but yeah. slow and steady. I'm in no hurry. For yeah. Sure. We were yeah. sorry. We didn't get to make it out to Summerfest. Yeah. This year. Yeah. But you guys are playing, the Guffs is playing, uh, at the, the Pabst, right? Pabst, yeah. yeah. We, we're doing a little co-headlining show, if I may say so myself. Uh, with co-headlining the with the Bodines, yeah. Uh, the no, Pabst. you guys are totally headlining that. I won't accept <laughs> the Bodines are headlining anything. I will not accept that. You guys are headlining. Well, you're not going to hear it from me because I got to like be PC and I've got some NDAs and some contractual obligations about not defaming anybody. Yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah. But you're you're opening. Uh, you're, you're you're headlining. You're, you're that's fine. Yeah. Well, we're yeah, so it's all good. And we're actually we just uh, announced a show today. We're playing the City Winery in Chicago the night before. So oh, cool. we'll be in oh. Chicago uh, twelve twenty eight, and then we're coming up to Milwaukee to rock the Pabst on twelve twenty nine. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. Looking wow, forward. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I'm getting these guys to go. We're gonna go. We're gonna get tickets, and we're gonna go check it out. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you know anybody that has tickets to your show. Oh, yeah. I, I will, you know what? Hey, for you, Tom, I will put out some feelers and I will see. <laughs> I will see who's in charge of that shit. And ask the boss. I'm just kidding. If, if you guys go back like to the days, like we we had the most obscene like guest lists and all this stuff and like tickets, like you know they'd have to like set aside X amount of tickets, which were, you know, okay. Now we're actually going from making money to just ba- barely breaking even. And uh, so now with the whole COVID thing too, it's like, we're like, even our family, we're just like, nobody's in. It's like, you guys, you want to come? Everybody's buying tickets. There's right. no backstage. There's nothing. It's like, we'll see you at the bar afterwards. And that's about it. So ha- have, the, wor- the world has changed. Has the, have the shows been, I, it's just, it's so weird with, with COVID world now, Yeah, you know, where you don't even know what to expect for. Yeah for crowds well, and who's, who's i know Summerfest was like down like 43 percent or something yeah. like that yeah, so, it, was, it was crazy so for them that's that's just crazy crazy money yeah. and and they weren't and it, offering crazy money for bands to come in either and they were having a lot yeah. of bands that it's also at the very last minute just dropped off because of covid protocols or lack thereof so like there it's also but how safe can you make it i mean are, are you going to get to a point where you stop serving alcohol because somebody comes to your show and drives home drunk and kills somebody? I'm, yeah. How safe well, can you get it? Like, no, no. Well, I mean, that's always yeah. been part of, part of the game, man. I mean, you know, if, yeah. if you're an adult and you're drinking, you've got to take responsibility for yourself. Right. Um, if I if I go to a show and I drink and I run into a wall, that's on me. But if I go to a show and I'm not vaxxed and I cough on the three of you, that's on me as well, you know, because right. mm-hmm. I just didn't do my due diligence on it. So, I mean, I don't want to get, I mean, this is a pop culture thing. I don't want to get into like the politics, unless Chris, you want to get in politics and I'll wax poetic for years. No, um, I, I get any, no, no. Okay. Tom says no. <laughs> well, is, was it, was it, was it, was it, was it that a vaccine yeah. has to be political. It's crazy. <laughs> well, everything's political. You know, how it goes. I mean, music is, is. music is political. I mean, you, you could ask like a certain segment of the population, man. We, we were either loved by the, the masses, but we were also just hated equally by a certain percentage of the, uh, the music industry. Really? And, oh, God, yeah, man. Fucking bands hated Why? us. Because we sold out shows. Because chicks went to your show? Well, That's the your bands point. hated well, you guys. Well, the bands and music industry people. So we, we, yeah. we, would always, we always get, traditionally, we would get panned that we weren't real musicians. We weren't real songwriters. We weren't a real Milwaukee band. Um, that was sort of like the standard, uh, go-to for years, you know, just because all of a sudden we're, we're doing something completely different and I, I, and something that was our own, uniquely our own. And whether you liked it or not, I mean, we've grown as a band. I mean, it's like, I can't even listen to our first album. I think it sucks, but there is that little nugget of where we started and where we were going to on where we've ended up now. I think the stuff that we write now and the last couple albums we did were pretty cool. Yeah. But like anybody, man, and nobody likes to look at their like middle school or freshman year high school picture and go, God, I, I, I was rocking it. I was rocking the fuck out of that mullet. 
and that really weird <laughs> JC Penny top, whatever my mom bought me the, to wear for photo day. You know, I don't so know what you're talking about my windbreakers were awesome. Oh, I bet you they were. Man. <laughs> and I know Tom's member his only jackets were 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 killer. Yeah, I, flight pants. <laughs> <laughs> Flight plants Charlotte in middle Mohit. school was not great growing up. You can't uh, hide those middle school narbs and flight <laughs> pants. <laughs> oh man. I think you should break those out for the 29th bed. I think you should put those on and come out to the show. <laughs> <laughs> All flight pants. I'm I'll, them. I'll get him some. Yeah, I think well, you should. Well, you have time. You've, you've got. I mean, more. there's Goodwill, right? They've got to have some. Somebody's got to have someone somewhere. Yeah. Amazon. Email. Amazon and eBay. Yeah, yeah. Amazon's yeah. getting everything, man. I mean, you guys just put out um, some new stuff fairly recently. That's that's really awesome. Yeah, we put out a uh, uh, last single we put out was a new tune called One. So we started, uh, Gordon and I started writing some tunes like during COVID like, lockdown. And first song that we wrote was actually, we started writing it back in like March, just when things just shut down. And that was mm-hmm. a hero that we released last year. And then um, shortly after that, like right around that whole sort of uh, Minneapolis um, kerfuffle that was going on like in uh, June, we ended up writing a song called One. And then it just took us a little bit of time. We're, we're like spread across four cities. So it's, you know, there's one guy in Minneapolis, one guy in Nashville, one guy in Chicago, one guy in Milwaukee. Yeah. We actually wrote everything remotely and then we recorded everything remotely, which was bizarre, but welcome to I'm the like new it. reality. Zoom so, calls and then recording your stuff separately and sending it in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was, so I was going to ask if that was a COVID, a COVID song. You know. Oh yeah, all, all it is. We actually have a, a couple other ones too that are just sort of sitting, lingering, just because we can't get motivated to actually get in our studios or get things up and running. But mm-hmm. yeah, um, Gore and I wrote that. We just, you know, as things were sort of shutting down, we just reached out to each other and like, hey man, you know, what's going on? And we would always send like stuff. Like every time he writes something, he'll send me something if. It was not like a, a Goran solo project thing that he's like, hey, the, this could be a cool guff song and he'll send it to me and I'll do the same thing. And we just go back and forth. And then finally, we sort of just got on a Zoom call and I'm like, hey, I got a really cool chord progression. And we started playing around with it. And then we're just sort of like a couple hours later, we got a little bit of a melody and we got like a line or two. We sort of stumbled on this, like, I'll be your hero concept. Mm-hmm. Um, and then over the course of the next, you know, probably two, three weeks, we just slowly built it. And once we demoed it, then he actually came over to my place and we just did a really quick demo. So, you know, just laid down like a little drum riff and then uh, played some little guitar and a little bass and he just recorded like the whole thing. And then we sent it to the rest of the band and then we sort of took that and then like built it in reverse. So we had the structure, the start and the finish of the song. We sent it to Scott, our drummer, and then he recorded the drums for the song. It got sent back to me. I recorded the bass for the song. We sent it up to Morgan in Minneapolis. He records the guitar for the song and then Goran, Goran would come in at the very end and he would record like the, his guitar and lyrics. And then we actually did it with, um, we produced it with, um, Scott Starr from like uh, fever Marlene and, uh, he runs a little studio called rev pop. So it's like a little design branding and, and uh, music video studio. And he just slowly, he sort of took the track and just made it his own. You know, he became like the fifth member of the band for this track and, put in all this really, really cool to sonic, uh, like landscape to it, really cool keyboard parts, really yeah. sort of chopped and edited what we were doing, um, like overdrove the bass, like on one verse, which was super cool, you know, cut out like the rhythm on one verse. And it was just sort of, he did his own thing and really put a, his stamp on it. And it was a lot of fun. So we did that. We did another song and then we've got a couple other songs that we want to get to, but I just don't know where we're at in, in terms of committing to it, you know, time wise. So, yeah. do you feel it's easier uh, working with your brother on songs because you can be way more brutally honest with your brother than you can a friend? Um, yeah, the two of us are beyond brutally honest. I mean, it's you know, without actually like swinging at each other, it's like the the verbal assault at times is just it's epic, and you know, you you need a good like six hours of therapy afterwards. But <laughs> aside from that, you know, it's uh, um, no, we we've, we've always had that sort of just that relationship to where him and I are kind of polar opposites and then musically and stylistically we're polar opposites. He's much more sort of pop and soft. I'm much more rock punk and heavy. Um, but somehow that's, you know, that's been for a lot of people, that has been one criticism of the band. We had a producer, the producer, when we're 
getting ready to do our first Atlantic album back in like 96, 97. Yeah, it was like 97. We were getting ready to record the second, the follow up. And we interviewed like uh, like Matt Serletic, who did all the Matchbox 20s stuff. And he, we met him. We played a show at the Cotton Club in Atlanta. And he comes up to us afterwards. We're sitting in the green room and he's talking. And he's like, yeah, he goes, I just don't get you guys. And we're just looking at each other like, okay. He's like, make a decision. Are you a pop band or rock band? And I almost, like, I almost pissed myself. I'm just like, okay, you just lost this gig. And that would have paid you a lot of fucking money. But, you know, uh, and we just said, hey, we're both, man. Yeah. It, it's like we, we can't deny what we are, you know. And it's not just like one guy that writes the songs and like in a matchbox or a hoodie and throws it out. And that's your sound. It's, you know, we're, we're two guys and four guys that are basically fighting for sonic space and you know, when we write a song, we, we go through it with the band, you know, everybody sort of adds and subtracts and builds up and destroys little pieces of it till it becomes a guff song. And I think at the end, that's how you get like a smile, you get a crash, you get a Sunday driver and even the new tunes, you know, they're all kind of in that vein as well, you know, a yeah. little bit of both. And, and with my brother, you're, you're always going to have a really, really pretty melody and you're always going to have a like, you know, a really a pretty sounding voice. So that, and then, the rest of us, we just try to make him a little bit uglier than he is. <laughs> I think that's what makes your sound so cool. I mean, it's yeah. it's different. It's I mean, why do you have to pick a lane? I mean, that's boring. Absolutely, <laughs> no, we just try. Cool. We just we just keep weaving. We're just I mean, we're that annoying son of a bitch in the left lane that just doesn't know if he wants to pass or if he just wants to slow down. So I hate that son of a bitch. But I love your sound. I, I, yeah, I, think there, I think there's a lot of great bands that mix genres. You know, you don't have to pick one genre. You just uh, oh, you know, absolutely. This... Well, and I think it's so amazing that you can that we have the technology, you know, that we do now that you could do this. You don't have to be song, in the same room. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know and... the way you did, and I think it. I mean, that song turned out amazing. I yeah really yeah really like it. Yeah, the way that it came out, I mean, we're, we're surprised because 90% of the time, like most of the songs that we would write, we'd always, we would always like just get in a room and with an idea and then hammer them out together as a band and work through the arrangements, work through sort of like the dynamics of it, you know, maybe add a part, subtract a part. And so it was really weird to all of a sudden have this and like not have anybody give you feedback, immediate feedback. Because a lot of times we'd be like, dude, don't play that bass riff. Wait for the like the third verse to play that bass riff. Leave it, leave it alone. And so the whole time you're sitting there and you're recording and you're doing your own part, you're hearing these voices in your head, which are the other three guys. And you're like, what should I be doing? You know, and you'd be second guessing yourself. And then all of a sudden you'd be saying, okay, well, I know Morgan would say this if I played this right here or I didn't play this right here or, you know, and I know what Glenn would say because I always hear his voice in my head. <laughs> and then, you know, so it, it was, it, it was weird. It was, um, it was a little bit strange, you know, in a way it was liberating, but in a way it was also constricting that you didn't have that freedom to get that like automatic feedback that we've had for 30 odd years mm -hmm. um, for somebody to say, Hey, that's really cool, but wait for that. Don't do that right away. Kind of thing. So, you know, yeah, hearing voices, to... hearing voices in your head explains your backdrop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, just yeah, so you well, don't start talking back to them. He's down there yeah. going, I know, Morgan, come on. <laughs> so all of a sudden you'll see like hand puppets on the wall where they. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. So, yeah. It was pretty good. That's my Doberman pitcher. <laughs> oh. I don't know what that lights to. Are you okay, Tom? Yep, I got a bum foot. Tom trying to almost go out. broke his foot right before I saw the hunting. pictures, yeah. I saw the pictures. Oh, yeah, it's bad. Well, it's what you get because for playing volleyball. I like <laughs> playing volleyball. Are you going hunting this year, Dan? Um, I have been already. So our season starts like early oh. October 1st, so archery. And then uh, I was just down weekend for, uh, yeah, just last weekend for opening of a uh, gun. And then heading back in a couple weeks. And See, then that's... That was my reason why you moved to Chicago. You, <laughs> your wife found out you offered, you invited me and Molly down, and she's like, "Well, you're yeah. moving." <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's all that was to it. They're gonna come. That was yeah, it. There's, there's still season left, so we still got uh, until January fourth. There's only uh, another 
this week, this upcoming week, and the weekend after is still gone. Then wow, muzzle loader is. for the first two weeks of uh, December, and then it will go to archery till January fourth, and then the season ends. Oh wow! Ours yeah. doesn't start till Saturday. Really, we get nine days with the gun. Yeah. We don't miss as much as people from that, Illinois. That's, 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 actually, that's, a, that's a Daniel Ray song title, Nine Days with a Gun. <laughs> I like it. I like that, That's actually, that, that'll actually be good. Be about the trials and tribulations of Tom and Molly up in the Northern Woods. <laughs> hey, we just got to move to Chicago, Tom. We got to move to. There you go. I don't think I can. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hate I driving in I, that I don't city. think I can either. So. <laughs> Yeah, every time yeah. I drive in Chicago, I'm like, I could never live here. It's so much traffic. Oh. I'm, used, I'm used to my little town. <laughs> That's right. Nothing wrong with little towns. Yeah. Well, I think you get used to it. Yeah. So are you working on anything new for your solo stuff? Uh, yeah, I've got some. Uh, so like right now I'm sitting against the wall. I finally, after uh, a long period of time, I got my studio set up. And so I'm like now just sort of as I'm uh, doing this little podcast, it's actually through my whole system and stuff, which is uh, means that I am ready to record. So nice. I've got a lot of new music that I just need to get to. But the problem that I have, I love writing. I love performing. And I fucking hate recording. It yeah. is. How's the sound in a dungeon? Oh, I don't know, man. I, it's, I think it's pretty good. You know, if I get closer to the mic, it'll sound a little bit better, sexier. But um, Ooh, careful. I get, yeah, I gotta step. I gotta step back all the way. But it, Amas it will, only uh, got so many pairs of underwear she can <laughs> soak through. Man, you gotta be careful. Easy, ma. Easy, ma. Come on, come on. You you could go to Target and get her a, a twelve pack. You know. <laughs> yeah, this will get you through an hour podcast. <laughs> Oh, dude, you're brutal, man. This is brutal. I thought this is a pop culture podcast, and this is just like so, so not. It uh, is, but then you've got Tom on here. I, yeah, well, I that's true. Chris, condolences for that. Yes, yeah. but you know. hey, he asked me. He pays yeah. me. Yeah, there you go. Well, it's mutually beneficial and destructive. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I've got a bunch of stuff that I'm going to start recording. So, um, like, just. I, I have a tendency to what, write way too much and record way too little. So I've probably got another uh, another couple albums worth of stuff that I just need to figure out how I want to present it. And you definitely like don't... doing the fun part of it. That's all that is, that is. Yeah. Well, the fun part of it is like the, the creative part and then sort of like trying to get that, you know, I think for my for me musically too, I think my my stuff comes across best in some dimly lit dive bar where the whiskey and the cheap beer are flowing freely. And um, the Mollies of the world are dancing in the back, and um, you know it's just a, it, you know it's just that kind of vibe, you know, just like acoustic guitar and just sort of uh, solo singer songwriter kind of thing. And for me, it's mm -hmm. difficult, like coming from my background, trying to figure out how that translates onto something recorded, you know. And it's like I'm not I'm not good enough to where I'm going to just do a live recording and there you have it, you know. There's way too many just like imperfections and fuck ups and missed, you know, beats and dropped, you know, broken strings and whatever it may be. Uh, so I'm trying to find that sort of like that middle ground to where what I hear in my head and how I think the music should come across live and does come across live. How, how could I do that then and record it? So I'm going to simple thing, you know, a pair of things down, like considerably, it's not going to sound like the first album, which was just probably me just, overreaching a little bit and wanting to play like every single instrument I possibly could, um, which I did with the exception of the, the drum stuff, which uh, Mike Bleasner, the, you know, my, my studio guy did for me. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm going to just keep it really sort of simple, low key and, and um, see where it goes. Try to get out some music before the end of the year, at least an EP. I, I'll, I'll definitely get out an EP before the end of the year. And then I think hopefully once that happens, then the floodgates will open up and then, you know, there'll be a couple albums all ready to go. Cause I just keep writing and there's way too much music to record. How many instruments do you play? Um, train on guitar, obviously played bass with the band. And then over the last like five years, I picked up, um, I could play a little bit of banjo, not like really like impressive banjo, but I could play passable banjo, mm -hmm. uh, mandolin, uh, dulcimer, 
Um, it's all string stuff, which is sort of easy for me and picking out melodies. Right. Play a little bit of a uh, Dobro slide guitar mm -hmm. and then ukulele. And then some of the stuff that I put on the album is just like just sort of a little one handed little mini keyboard thing that, uh, you know, I, I pick like a, an accordion sound or something like that. And I hear a melody that I want to play, but it needs to sound like an accordion or it needs to sound like a flute or something. You know, that's really cool. It's My, cool. uh, Ron Burgundy kind of shit. So, <laughs> my aunt and uncle, <clears throat> my aunt and uncle had a bluegrass band, and cool. my uncle was a Spanish teacher, but also he could play pretty much anything with strings. And yeah. for every one of their shows, they would load up the van with like at least one of every instrument, and he would switch throughout the show and play like a different instrument every song. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like Prince, probably, man. Yeah. So entertaining. Well, like those, those bluegrass guys, that, and that's actually something that you know sort of got me going as well. I started there was a little little place called the Friendly Tap where I was living out in Berwyn, and they had a little coffee shop and a little music uh, store where they uh, taught lessons to people. And they started teaching like bluegrass classes, and I took um, this class with this guy from uh, Nashville. His name is uh, Jeff Burke. He's down there now. He works at the Station Inn. But he teaches like what's called the Wernick method. And the Wernick method is basically for people that are just, you could take like the best guitar players and people that just started, best fiddle players, people that just started, banjo, all this. And the whole concept is just to get like the four of us in the room, no matter how good or bad you are. And we're just going to play songs together. And we're each going to take a, 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 a moment and do like a little lead, no matter how good or bad it is. And you go through this a couple of times and all of a sudden you realize, despite your own limitations, this is like really fun. And all the bluegrass stuff is all like all sing along and it's all the same three chords and just the melody slightly changes. And so I started doing that. And then all of a sudden, you know, I realized that these guys, you know, like this guy, you pick up a mandolin, you pick up a banjo, you pick up a fiddle, you pick up a guitar, you pick mm -hmm. up a bass. And you're like, Oh my God, this is like sort of standard for these bluegrass guys. And it's, it was sort of inspiring. And so then I'm like, Man, I could I could pluck a I could I could learn I know how chords work. I could learn chords on ukulele. I could learn chords on a mandolin. Yeah. Um, I may not be the best, but you know, at the end of the day, like what you hear on my album, that's actually me plucking every instrument with the exception of the drums. Um, you know, so but it was it was fun. It was it was a really good experience, a good learning experience. You know, that's awesome. experience so, what to do and what not to do. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about finger versus pick. Ooh. Well, yeah. <laughs> it all depends on who you ask. So that's okay. He's asking the, you. <laughs> asking you. So the fingers work really well, and the fingers are, you know, and it's funny because like the it's the bass. I, mean, it should, it should. <laughs> I can't imagine what it's doing to to, yeah. to mama, mama time. Uh, <laughs> she's tapping but, out. <laughs> she's tapping out. Good, good to she, know. She's um, tapped out. It's. You know, so people would always like make comments, you know, like the, the truth, there's always like these sort of elitist purists that you're not a bass player if you're playing with a pick. Well, I'm like, dude, I don't give a shit what you say, man. I grew up in the punk punk era and I grew up listening to bands like R.E.M. and all these other like, you know, bands that it doesn't matter if you play with a, a pick or, or with your fingers. Ultimately it matters how good is the groove, how good is the melody. And I've seen some people that are just, you know, phenomenal bass players that play one way. And I've seen other bass players that are phenomenal the other way. Um, and then too, for us, like depending on the song, a lot of our stuff was like fast. So we're playing really fast mm -hmm. stuff that needs to be really attacky sounding. And so when you're playing with your fingers, you get more of a, just a, a warmer tone. It sort of blends. You don't get to hear that single like note thud. It's more like woo rather than you know, and kind of thing. And so ultimately I was taught to like serve, serve the song, serve the song and do what's right by the song. And if that means playing less, you play less. If that means playing more or over the top, then you play over the top. But at the end of the day, you got to answer to the rest of the band and like, okay, what works best for us here? You know, and, and depending on the albums and stuff, you know, I recorded a lot of stuff, you know, playing with finger, but I grew up playing as a pick player because I was a guitar player and I learned, you know, flat picking was the way that I learned how to play. And so for me, that was like the most natural transition to become a bass player is to just like sort of flat pick things you know yeah. so and then you can get rid of that sound too if they don't like the attack on that you could roll that all off in your eq and you know change up your tone a little bit so where all of a sudden you can't tell i'm playing with a pick unless you're just yeah. a purist 
<laughs> asshole bass player and like, hey, dude, he plays the pick. He's not a real bass player. Yeah, who does so I've, I've, I've heard that stupidity before. I'm like, I go like, all right, cool. All right, whatever you like, man. It's all good. All right, I'm the guy on stage. Where are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I've always wanted to learn how to play guitar. I I, uh, I played violin uh, <clears throat> and wanted to learn how to play fiddle style, um, but I no longer have my violin. I still think it'd be cool to learn guitar. Christmas gift. Not too late, right? Christmas gift. There you go. Nudge, yeah. nudge, wink, wink. Oh, son of a... Hey, Tom, get me <laughs> an electric I... guitar. <laughs> I was I was thinking you a I think you get a violin and go back to what you know. To fiddle players, there's not enough fiddle players out there. <laughs> So, in the fiddle style, too. Oh, Tom's hogging all the bandwidth. You can get those electric ones now that are not too expensive. Yeah. And then oh, the electric. The electric violins, and then you can plug them in, and you can practice without everyone having to hear you. Kind of cool. Yeah, we can go on America's Got Talent, Molly. I'll tell jokes, and you play the fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> to the bad punchlines, and, and the only the only thing you need to know is like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> that's it. No, I'm coming out there like Lindsay Sterling, man. <laughs> Who the hell is Lindsay Sterling? <laughs> You've never seen her. She plays uh, electric violin and she dances while she's doing it. She's freaking. I love her. I was thinking of the other chick fiddle player. <laughs> no. The other one? How many are there? There's, there's two. One. There's at oh, least there two. There's, there's, there's only least, two. There's only two in the world. There's only two. There's Lindsay and the other one, the non-Lindsay. Yeah. Charlene Daniels? That's all I know. Charlie Daniels? Oh, Charlie Daniels. There you go. The devil oh, went yeah. down to Georgia. That's the one you know? That's it. That's the only single song I know. <laughs> Devil was a chump. Lost I think that's fiddle. the only fiddle song you need to know. Yeah. No, no. What well, you're, no, you're a, a Chopin farewell? I think what? is okay. I'll give you that. A, a my Chopin daughter, my daughter that. takes violin, so I get to hear the violin play every freaking day in her bedroom. So, so you oh, are wait. a big fan. I'm a, I can a little salty <laughs> on violin players right now. So don't get Molly a violin, or I'll be in the same Bill and Ted nightmare yeah. <laughs> you're living get her, in. Get Molly a guitar. <laughs> Whatever. It sounds like Dan needs a fiddle player. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna go, go fiddle brush Molly. up on my skills and learn fiddle. Yeah, fiddle, fiddle. Like if if I could get a bass player, a fiddle player, and like a slide player, that would be good. That would be like that would round off a, a band for me. Upright bass, yeah. fiddle, and slide. Yeah. Taking resumes now. <laughs> I, I, I know an upright bass and a fiddle player. <laughs> I played bass in high school. Did you really? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Very cool. You did not. I did. Most, most definitely did. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. And going through that midlife crisis, Chris, you definitely look like you could jump on a band or start I a band. Could, yeah. I think Maybe. the bass players always, I always thought they had it the, the best because they didn't have to, for the most part, lug their, their bases around because they were so All big. Those, and they, had, they were heavy. Well, but you'd, didn't really have to lug them around as much. The cello players still had to lug theirs around. I still had to lug mine. The bass players didn't have to. <laughs> I had to. It's a fiddle. How hard is it to lug? You put it in your back pocket. It's a pretty big fiddle. It's, <laughs> they're not. <laughs> they're, they're pretty like heavy. Big. Well, the fiddle, yeah, but I'm talking well, about the bass. Sticking it, oh. Try sticking it in your locker uh, between classes. There you go. And that's holding you back today? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Stop it. Yep. I'm sorry. That's all right. I will take the blame. It's okay. All right, Chris, what else you got for him? Uh, well, you know, I guess I was going to ask, because uh, you guys got anything coming out with the Guffs? I know you guys uh, put out a record about every ten years, so anything Roughly. for the fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're sort of on the uh, what was the last one? Last one was man, it's been over ten years. So last uh, album was two thousand six, and then we just started releasing these two songs. Um, you know, we have a handful. Uh, Gore and I have a handful of songs, and we probably 
would be able to cobble together an album's worth, to be honest with you. So, but um, I just don't know if we collectively just have the bandwidth, like how quickly to do it. It just, each song took a really long time. By the time it was written, then, you know, it was like mm -hmm. six months later, eight months later, it was recorded and out. Uh, so at that pace, you know, we're probably going to release a new album at, in 2025, roughly. Well, or maybe maybe we should do 2026, okay. then it's a good 20 years after. 20 years. There you go. Right. Yeah. That'll make yeah. it make it a real special release. This one took us double the time and it's a little bit I, I imagine it takes <laughs> it's I more than it takes double the time. <laughs> yeah. We well, said Except every 10 years and this is and this might be 20, yeah. So you have to make sure you have to make sure you release it on vinyl so all of your fans in the retirement home can play it on their Victor Olas. Absolutely. I think that's what we're gonna have to do. So I mean, man, I don't even know, man. We're just we we're sort of laughing the fact that you know I'm, I'm the youngest of the band and I just turned fifty and we're, man, so we're all wow. we're all getting there, you know. And pretty soon we're gonna be pushing pushing the big six zero, and then after that, I don't even, I don't even know. I don't. I could see myself playing small dive bars with an acoustic guitar and a bottle of whiskey until I die. Yeah. Whether or not the four of us could continue to appear on stage in a respectful <laughs> in a respectful <laughs> way uh over the next 10 15 years i don't know we you know we still we still could pull it off we just, we're, we're we still have it together we're we're not that yeah. bad but i don't know if we could pull off like a rolling stones like 75 80 year old dudes <laughs> doing what we do that's you know? your retirement yeah. plan you're just gonna take the guitar knock on dive bars <laughs> yeah Hey, I'm, gonna sleep in, I'm, gonna sleep, I'm gonna sleep in the back of a van and just literally drive two hours to the next town and play a show and get 20 bucks for food. gas and eat a taco you know free just whiskey one? while you play that's that's all i need i'm good <laughs> you've got a fair right, we got a couple young, gigs lined uh, up for drum you player. what's that molly you got a fairly young drunk drummer now right for the guffs oh um no, uh, I was, are you thinking of Bailey? He's like, he's played a little bit with my brother. So, and yeah, he is, he's a kid. Oh. Man. I mean, he's like, he's like six years older than my son, maybe. Um, but yeah, he just, he plays with uh, Gorn and Morgan when they do some solo stuff. And when we did that, um, we did a little show where I opened up for Gorn at Shankal not too long ago. Bailey, Bailey played on, on that thing. So that was Technically, it's not a guff. It's not a quote-unquote guff show unless all four of us are there. So then it's usually a guff's acoustic thing, and that just means it's it's Gore and Morgan and whoever they get cobbled together. Okay. So see, you guys are all doing your own stuff. Why don't you rent a cabin with no Wi-Fi and just lock you all in there? Yeah. And put out an album by next year. Yeah. Just lock I, yourself I, in. I got a place. I got a place. We don't even have to rent out in Indiana. Just trying to get these guys to commit to it. There you, know. you go. Tell them it's just say it's not optional. They have. I think you, you guys need to start like a a pressure campaign. A new go album. to Dan's <laughs> cabin. Yeah. Come on, they'll, guys, they'll lock it down. <laughs> love it, Matt. No running water, no electricity. We're we're golden. That I mean, he basically just, he just admitted that time is time is running out. So. Oh yeah, yeah. that's true. Gotta, I mean, gotta get cracking. Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, it would be nice. We we definitely have um, we got a couple really cool songs um, that I was hoping we were gonna get to record. Uh, there's this one tune called "Home," and it's probably got one of the coolest bass lines I've ever written. And it just sort of sounded started with this like super groove, and uh, Gorn and I pieced it together. And it's got really cool lyrics. And so now it's just a matter of, like uh, get Scott and Morgan to commit to it and get it done. So. But I want to I want to hear that one. I want to hear that one. Scott starred, Rev popped up, and then uh, thrown out there. So we had two songs, and we only need you know what another six or so to really get an EP. Uh, well, I guess LP. What is it? Six for a EP, and then eight for a LP or something like that. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. So we're not that far off. We we definitely have a handful of good tunes that we could, we could do. So it's just a matter of uh, knocking some heads together. And then you got to do the world tour. Yeah. We'll do we'll do, we'll do a couple shows in Wisco and we'll do a couple shows in uh, Chicago. <laughs> yeah, our world tour days are over. That's a that's a young man's <laughs> game and it's fucking brutal. It's there. I mean, it sounds really yeah. sexy until you got like eight guys no, sleeping definitely. in like one comfort lodge in bed together, you know, and like spending twelve hours a day in a 
in a really crappy van. So that's not the good old days anymore. That's the, it's the good old days. I'm just, they're good and old. So it's, <laughs> and, we're, and we're good. We'll and old, so. there. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll, yeah. I'll take my Jeep. I'll, I'll hit the road in my Jeep with a, you know, my thermo rest and a nice sleeping bag in the back. I'll be good to go. Turtle top on top, you know, I'll have a month worth of supplies. So I'm good. There you go. Well, I, I had heard that you guys were really popular on the East Coast, like New York. Did you have a lot of fans over there? You know, we had, uh, I mean, when we started, so when we started touring just like organically, you know, it's like we started as a Milwaukee band and then it was Milwaukee Madison, Milwaukee Madison, Green Bay, Milwaukee Madison, Green Bay, Chicago, Minneapolis. And then we slowly, like in 92, 93, started to hit out to the Midwest and by probably in like end of 93, 94, we had like lot, we locked down the sort Midwest college market, you know, sort of everything from Des Moines, Ames, Quad Cities, Urbana, Champaign, Peoria, uh, all the way down to St. Louis, Indianapolis, Evansville, you know, so all those, anywhere there was a college we had through the Midwest. And then when we got signed, we signed with, um, Man, I can't remember what the name of the agency was back then, but it was kind of from Maglish. I think he's with CCA, CAA or now or whatever. I don't even know what they're called. But he ended up like getting us on these uh, East Coast tours, basically from um, we were hitting everything from Boston and every place in between all the way into like Virginia Beach. And that that was great because like your travel times were only like an hour and a half at the most to the next gig. So we would be out partying all night long and we knew we had all day to sleep. So all you need is one sober person to like drive you from Boston to the next city, which is like just an hour down the road. And so back back then, like probably 95 to 99, we had really good crowds. We were playing like the Middle East Club in in uh, in Boston and bringing really good crowds. We were playing the 930 in D.C., bringing really good crowds. New York was always a little bit weird, you know, but we play like, you know, Mer- Mercury Ra- Lounge, Brownies, a couple of little smaller places, but we always would have a good crowd, but a lot of it's industry people, um, you know, New Jersey as well, and uh, VA, you know, there's a couple places that we would play, but we were sort of Hootie and the Blowfish, Dave Matthews Band were right about the same time. So there's a lot of those sort of college areas that they're playing up and down the coast in the Carolinas as well. So we had we had a good run, but it was never it was never like crazy like we had in the Midwest. You know, we had huge crowds in Springfield, Missouri. Springfield, Missouri, back in the day was, um, I think, just after we got signed, we went and played our first show there, some five six hundred seater. We'd never been there before in our lives, and we roll up and there's like a line out the door, and we're like, "What the fuck are all these people doing here? Who are they here for?" And then all of a sudden, you realize that our song is getting blown up. You know, "Smile or Crash" was getting blown up on radio. And we go in and we played a sold out show. It was, it was phenomenal. Um, wow. But we were, we were more Midwestern, like, you know, sort of like the great Midwest kind of band. And then mm-hmm. we did really well in Atlanta. Um, we did really well in part, you know, little little pieces here and there. Uh, there was a couple of places in Pennsylvania that we really did. Philly, we always had a good crowd in Philly. Um, good crowd in like some of the Carolinas and stuff like that. But, you know, I mean, we were going from playing like Milwaukee where we're playing, you know, in front of a thousand, 1200 people, but then you go out to one of these clubs, you're playing in front of two, 300 people, but still it's a packed venue. And that's all you, that's all you care about. You know, it doesn't matter if you're in a 50 seater, as long as there's 50 people in that 50 seater, you're, you're happy, you know? So, but we had a good run. We were fortunate, man. So it's looking back, it was, it was a good time. So. That's awesome. Just reading some comments. Um, yeah, that sounds, um, amazing. Do you have anything coming out with, for, uh, Daniel Ray anytime soon? Um, nothing like right now. So we got nothing booked for the rest of the year. Uh, I'm just taking this, just going to chill a little bit at the holidays. We got some rehearsals and stuff coming up for the guffs. So, but I'm, my stuff is easy so I could pick up a gig last minute. I always, when I, when I come up to Milwaukee, I always like call a handful of friends. I'm like, Hey, let's do like a pop-up somewhere. So I'll end up like, you know, maybe at like sabbatic, you know, on a Friday night at 11 o'clock and do a show with like a, a couple of people that I know, like, you know, uh, Owen, Car- uh, Ian McCarthy, Owen McCarthy from um, Whiskey the Damned or some other people like Joe Crockett or something like that. So um, I might reach out. We're coming up for rehearsals in first week and third week of uh, December. So I'm always That's looking cool. for something to do when we're done with rehearsals. I just want to hit the bar and keep drinking and playing. So 
I might put something together last minute. Yeah, I know Owen. Yeah. Cool dude. So Very how cool do we dude. get how do you get notified of the the special pop up events? Or you uh, just gonna so, have to be gotta, there. It's gonna be social media stuff. So I'm <laughs> I'm I'm all about the the Instagram and the Face Book. So uh, that's you know, that's that's the only way we like advertise anything anymore. And like outside of like, you know, guff shows that you've got people right. like the Paps group that are like promoting it or city winery that are gonna promote those shows. But otherwise it's like I don't know how else you communicate to people. You know, we used to, everything used to be email lists back in the day. And before that it was mailers. And and before that we would use the walk around the East side, put up flyers every time we had a show, you know, so we were literally yeah. pacing flyers. And that was back in the day when there, you know, the flyer wars where you'd have a show on the same night, like somebody like, you know, wild kingdom would have a show. So they put their flyers over yours and then you'd go tear down their flyers. And then it just go back and forth all night long. You know, it was just, it was like a, <laughs> Epic street battle, the Sharks versus the Jets kind of thing, you know, but yeah. When you're in chat. It's like, man, I had a butterfly knife around here. I could have gotten really cool and fancy. That would have been I think awesome. I left it upstairs. That would have been amazing. So, so what, who, who inspires you? What, what, what musicians inspire you? Um, so that's like a two part question for, so in terms of, you know, as a, as a bass player for the band, um, I was heavily influenced by uh, Les Patterson from Echo and the Buddymen, stylistically, what he was doing and melodically. Uh, Mike Mills from REM, I was a big fan of his. Um, you know, I listened to the music that I listened to, you know, was sort of everything from like Joy Division, New Order, um, you know, it's sort of like atypical bass playing. And I just, these guys that created these really cool little grooves and patterns. And so for me as a, as a bass player and a songwriter, that's, a, I think we're, I think a lot of the stuff that I cut my teeth on, you know, we really were into like Toad Wet Sprocket and it was cool. We played Summerfest, uh, Toad played before us and we actually got like a really cool picture of us with Glenn Phillips and it was just totally geeking out like fanboydom, you know, it's like, and the guy's like my age, but they ended up getting a record deal when he was like a, a 16 or 17 years old in high school. And they literally started right before we did. And we're like, oh my God, who are these kids, you know? And then, you're like, oh, this is something we could do. And so yeah. they they were an inspiration. So bands like that, you know, Guadalcanal Diary, um, I, you know, I really liked Let's Active back in the day, you know, another Athens, Georgia band. Uh, and then later on, you know, I was like, you know, like punk rock as well. So it's like, I took a lot of little pieces of, of the bands that I listened to, you know, um, and then try to create my own style from that. So for, for that part of my music career, those were the people that were really uh, inspirational to me. And then in terms of like, you know, guitar and what I'm doing on my solo stuff, you know, I'm definitely more into like the, you know, um, Steve Earls, you know, uh, Towns Van Zandt, um, you know, even like sort of older, like country, you know, like early Johnny Cash, Waylon and Willie kind of stuff. I'm a really big fan of like Doc Watson. You know, it's like if I, if I, if, if I could play guitar like Doc Watson, I think my life would be ideal, but you know, Nobody could play like Doc Watson. He was just such a phenomenal singular guitar player. Although Billy Strings is really close to, if you have, if you, if you heard him at all, he's a younger bluegrass artist, which is just phenomenal. Um, but I always like those, I don't know. I sort of like, you know, even like Nick Cave, you know, like murder ballads kind of stuff is, I always mm -hmm. like tend to that sort of that darker side of the world. That's the blue lighting and in the cave that I live in now of 20, you know, <laughs> yeah. 20 stories under, underneath the streets of Chicago. Um, there's something about that that always, always appealed to me, that sort of melancholia, that just sort of, you know, those traditional folk songs where they're singing about, you know, it's either broken hearts, or, but somebody ends up, somebody always ends up dead. You know, and I've, I've had people ask me, it's like, based on your music, you sing a lot about killing people. Have you ever killed a person? I'm like, I don't know, have I? <laughs> No, but yeah, um, yeah it's, it's I live with the Ninja like, Turtles. How do you know? Absolutely, man. Hold on. It's like pretty soon you're gonna. You're gonna <laughs> <laughs> I, this is total Ninja Turtle vibe, man. I just realized that it's like all of a sudden something like scampering behind. Me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just for me musically, I just um, we were always like with the Gus, very abstract, and now as a songwriter and a lyricist, I just I'm really into telling good stories, and you know, I've always been in literature and poetry and so like wordplay is really cool to me and trying to say something in a different way you know so there's 
for me, I'm drawing from a lot of little different wells of inspiration, depending on specifically what I'm doing, you know, but my, my stuff is a little bit, like I said, it's a little bit more Americana alt country. So I'm pulling from, you know, the Steve Earls, the Justin Towns Earls and, you know, Towns Van Sands. Uh, one artist I really like is Blaze Foley. He was like, you know, he had sort of a, a he was one of their contemporaries. He had a, a tragic, you know, ending trying to help somebody and ends up getting shot in the chest kind of thing. So I think he was like the, um, for Lucinda Williams had a song called Drunken Angel and Blaze Foley was the character that she sang about in Drunken Angel. Um, so like just the, those kind of things, you know, just that traditional Americana Appalachian, you know, death hymn type of stuff that seems to inspire me for some weird reason, but. I would have pegged you as a Lindsay Sterling fan. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to Google her and I'm very well, maybe I just, I just need to take a look. <laughs> so. Right, I guess that's all we have time for. I found her on TikTok recently. I'd love to see one of her concerts. <laughs> I, I got to look up who this girl is now. I don't know what you're talking about, Molly. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all very much. Appreciate oh. the time. Oh, thanks, Dan. Thanks, thank sir. you for coming. Nice seeing you again, man. We will see you on the Good 29th. See you too. All right, man. Sounds good. Thanks, you guys.